want to begin by saying thank you to everyone joining us today from across the country and the world. I'm Alexander Indez, CEO of Conscious Capitalism, Inc. I just so appreciate you taking the time to learn and grow in community with us today. Conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of capitalism in business. It's a movement of business leaders around the world working to change the practice and perception of capitalism to elevate humanity. And Conscious Capitalism Inc. is a nonprofit organization catalyzing that movement. This summer, we began to offer these virtual gatherings as a way for the community to see the ways that conscious capitalism is taking shape in the leadership journeys of our network and the business practices of those in our community. I hope you're enjoying this series as much as I am and excited for today's conversation. And before I introduce Hugh Barrymalter, I wanted to remind everyone that today's call is scheduled until 12.45 p.m. Eastern, 9.45 a.m. Pacific. So we have 45 minutes together. And for the first 30 minutes, we're going to have a conversation between Walter and Hubert, but then we're going to transition to questions from you. So if at any point you have any questions, go to the bottom of your screen in the Q&A box. Feel free to type in any questions that you want to share with Hubert and Walter, and we'll try to cover as many as we can at the end. If you have any technical questions or issues, please just email us at info at and we'll help you as quickly as we can. But without any further delay, today we're joined by Hubert Jolie and Walter Robb. Walter is going to be interviewing Hubert about his leadership journey at Best Buy, as well as his leadership philosophy and vision for the next era of capitalism. Hubert is a senior lecturer at the Harvard Business School and the former chairman and chief executive officer at Best Buy, as well as the author of the upcoming book, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. Hubert is going to be interviewed by Walter Robb, who is the former co-CEO of the Whole Foods Market and is currently an executive in residence at S2G Ventures, serving on the board of directors for the Union Square Hospitality Group, the Container Store, Food Maven, Hungry, Heat Genie, Afria, and Appeal Sciences, and was one of the individuals leading the conscious capitalism movement from the beginning. Hubert and Walter, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. We're so looking forward to your conversation. I am here. Here we Walter, go. Okay, so we're oh, okay good. good. All yeah. right. All right. Awesome. All right. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome everybody, and uh, add my welcome to Alexander's. And it's my honor and pleasure to bring my friend Hubert Jolie to share with all of you today. Uh, before we get started, uh, just want to—we were just talking uh, a kind of a funny story. Hubert is now uh, teaching at the Harvard Business School, and he just shared a story with all of us that he was. Um, about how his first week went to school. So you better just, just quickly, how did your first week at school go at Harvard Business School? Well, the good news, Walter, is I got invited for the second week and then I'm still <laughs> teaching. So, uh, you know, I'm having the time of my life. It's such a great mission, consistent with the mission of conscious capitalism. My dream is to help prepare these leaders to be, you know, the leaders of tomorrow who lift humanity very much along the lines of what we've talked about. Right, but I thought what was interesting, you said that you were more nervous entering your first week of school than you were at anything in business. And maybe it'd be good for some of the other leaders to hear, it's okay to be nervous, right? It's okay to be nervous. Exactly. <laughs> I, was a, I was a wreck. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, just so people get to know you as I do, I um, served on the board of uh, Arela Retail Leaders with Uber, and we did some other things together. But just maybe a little bit about your background so folks who don't know you, uh, before you came to Best Buy, a little bit about your background and, and uh, so forth before we get started with the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Walter. I was born in France a uh, long time ago, uh, studied in France, and <clears throat> my business career was split between the, the U.S. And, and France. I started with McKinsey and Company for a dozen years uh, and then led a, a, company, a set of companies in different industries, uh, uh, IT services. I was with EDS in France video games, so I, I greenlit World of Warcraft and was the CEO of a, a company that was then merged with Activision to form Activision Blizzard. So it was in the media and entertainment industry. Then I led, uh, part of the theme was you know, leading companies that were challenged by the internet. So I led Carlson Vagoli Travel, a corporate travel management company that was supposed to be killed by the internet. And we tripled the size of the company and quintuple profitabilities. And then I moved to Minneapolis. 12 years ago to lead Carlson companies 
which at the time was a travel and hospitality company. So TGI Fridays, a bunch of hotels, Radisson, Regent and, and whatnot, Carlson Marketing, and then a stake in Carlson Vagonly Travel. And then in the spring of 2012, I got a call about the, the best job. And I mean, other than this, what I would add, Walter, is that uh, in parallel to this career, I've been on this journey to sort of uh, really understand the meaning of, of work. And uh, uh, in the early 90s, was already talking about, you know, why do we work? And the purpose of a company is not to make money. And on this journey to then learn what it takes to uh, really unleash human magic. So, uh, the, you know, our life is not just our career and accomplishment, it's a, it's a personal journey uh, right. and, and uh, understanding the meaning of our lives in, in many ways, right? Right. And so, and so it's a lifetime pursuing those very important questions about why do all this work? Why do we spend so much time at work, et cetera, et cetera, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit later more in the depth of the things that you cover in your book. But let's take 2012 when you did go to Best Buy. And when we look back on it now, we can say... Uh, it's generally true that you're regarded as the, as the fellow that, that uh, along with your team, of course, that saved Best Buy, uh, something that seemed very unlikely at the time with all the, the trouble that was going on in the company and with the internet and Amazon and so forth. And so I guess um, uh, just how did you do it, Hubert? How did you turn around a company that was given up for dead? Well, the, you're right to point out that it was the, uh, you know, the effort of 125,000 uh, people the first thing was a diagnosis that I did. I studied before I joined the company, which made me realize that the world actually needed Best Buy. As customers, we need a place where to see, touch, and feel the technology and where we can get advice. So the customers needed Best Buy and the vendors needed Best Buy because they needed a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment. And I found that all of the, most of the issues, all of the issues of the company were essentially self-inflicted. We had neglected the customer and the quality of execution in the business. And so that gave me the hope that we could uh, turn around the, the company. How did we do it? So we didn't do the cut, cut, cut uh, approach that many thought we should do. Uh, you know, turnarounds oftentimes are, you know, uh, the, the manuscript is, uh, you know, you need to cut job, close doors. And we did, we really didn't do that. We studied with people. My first week on the job, we spent in stores listening to the frontliners and understanding what was broken so the search engine on the site was broken, you know, it didn't work, we had to fix this. Uh, the customer's perception that was that our prices were too high, so we decided to match Amazon prices. You know, the stores, the store layout was dated, there was way too much space for music and uh, DVDs and, 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 and video games. And our, uh, the way we were supporting the stores was, you know, inappropriate. The poor general managers, they had, you know, 40 things they needed to focus on, and so we had, which we started with listening to the people. We also started by building the team at the top. We have a big believer that fish brought from the head. So you have to clean the, the, the top. We reconciled with our founders. So it was then one team, one dream. If you remember at the time, Dick Schultz, wonderful man, wanted to take the company private. So that was a bit distracting, but we reconciled. Uh, and so we really started with people. And then to uh, do the turnaround itself, uh, instead of starting with people, we finish with people, meaning that uh, first lever in a turnaround for me is grow the revenue. Two is cut, you're going to cut costs, so cut non-salary expenses first. For example, we damage a lot of TVs, you know, at Best Buy, right, because we sell a lot of them. How can you reduce the shrink, the, not the shrinkage, but the TV junk out is an example. And you only cut jobs if you know revenue growth and non-salary expense reduction is not sufficient, so you do it as a last resort. The other thing about the turnaround, uh, Walter, it's all about creating energy, right? It's not so much, yes, you need to come up with a plan, but it's all about how you create energy. So instead of you know, a small group of people coming up with a plan, we co-created the plan with probably the top 100 people in the company. And then we got the bicycle going, right? And if you, I don't know if you've tried to direct a bicycle at standstill, it doesn't work, you fall, right? So you have to get the bicycle to you going. So you start making some uh, decisions, then you celebrate the wins and you build a uh, very human approach to, uh, uh, to this. So these were some of the things, the last thing I would say is we, you know, to your point about being nervous, we encourage vulnerability in the leadership group. So. After three months in the job, uh, I told my team, look, uh, I have a coach. Uh, you know, th this, this turnaround is going to require 
all of us to be the best leaders we can be, right? And that includes me. I have a coach. He's going to come in. He's going to ask you for feedback. And then I'm going to take it and decide, you know, the areas where I want to get better. And that signaled, you know, for the CEO to say, I need to get better. That signaled that it was okay for everybody to uh, want to get better. So setting the tone, the tone of vulnerability and, you know, in, improvement. So these are some of the things, in very short, you know, what we did. A very short, but very specific in terms of those, uh, you know, hearing the various th- various areas in which you pursued. I'm just curious, when you came in your the first couple of weeks on the job, again, you did not do the traditional cut, 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 and then we'll look around. You you took a very different approach. What was it in your background that allowed you to come in on that first couple of weeks and think differently about how to approach the turnaround? So I learned from a client of mine at McKinsey uh, in the early 90s, a, a set of principles that were core to this uh, mm-hmm. turnaround to uh, business leadership. First thing he told me is that you know, the purpose of a company is not to make money. Of course, you have to make money, but it's an outcome and it's an imperative. He talked about three imperatives. The people imperative, meaning having the right team, properly equipped and motivated. The business imperative, having customers who are happy. And the financial imperative, of course, you need to, 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 to make money. So, but it says it's really the excellence on the people imperative that leads to excellence on the business imperative that leads to excellence on the financial imperative. And so it was that principle you have to start with with people and then refuse to have, so see people as the, as the resource, as the source, as the alpha and the omega, as opposed to an input measure and the, you know, the less people you have, the better, uh, the better this is. So that was a key principle. The, the other thing is this, oftentimes we think in zero sum games. I think that's a disease uh, and people, you know, one of the things that this guy taught me is that 98% of the questions that I ask as either or are better answered as and. So should we take care of the customers or the employees, the customers or the shareholders, the short term or the long term, uh, and, and, and. And so it's this um, win-win approach that we also apply, by the way, to the vendors, mm-hmm. you know, the, and, and, and also how we competed with Amazon because people thought Amazon was gonna kill us, right? And that's, you know, the, so f- for, for the vendors, instead of squeezing the vendors, there was this realization that maybe we could work together. So Apple, of course, was opening all of these stores, right? Uh, and some other, you know, Microsoft was to Sony. Uh, my intuition was they actually, we can be a solution for them because building stores, if you're, you know, Samsung or Microsoft, that's not you know, your core business. So that's how we did these partnerships with, with all of the foremost tech companies in the world. Uh, enabling them to showcase their products in our stores, which was good for the customers because uh, they could see everything that was available. It was good for the vendors because in a matter of months, they had, you know, Samsung had 1,000 stores within our stores in the U.S. And it was good for us because, of course, we made some money uh, along, along the way. And ironically, maybe we'll talk about it later, we did a partnership with Amazon from all people uh, where we, we actually sell their products uh, in, in our stores. Really good. I think I think I just don't want to make sure people don't miss the strategic steps that you took with respect to cleaning up the stores, slimming down the general manager's responsibilities, repricing your products. All those were tactical strategic steps that you took along within this framework of of people first. But so once you got this thing rolling, the bicycle, or I call it a flywheel, once you get the flywheel turning, um, you did really then kind of shift to what you call the noble pursuit of purpose. And some of that you referenced with respect to your relationship with the supplier community, but maybe talk some more about once you had, you know, crossed over that you weren't going to die, you were alive and you were going and you had folks bought in, how did you then pursue, how did you then go out this next stage of what you call the noble pursuit of purpose? Uh, and, and purpose has become such a, a popular term. So I think it's, it's important to, to talk about it. So at some point we decided, yes, the turnaround is over. We can now focus on growing the company more strategically. And so how long was we, that period of time, by the way? It was about after three years after we started. Um, and it okay. was, you know, my vision was the same as Lou Gerstner when he took over IBM. The, at the beginning, the last thing that we needed was a vision. We needed execution and mm. improve the operations of the, of the business. And in many ways, operational progress creates strategic degrees of freedom. So we shouldn't, we should, it was good not to start with strategy, but by 
with operational improvement. But after three years, it's all right, the turnaround is over. The, we can focus on, let's define what we want to look like when we grow up, right? What kind of company do we want to be? So we started with a customer, of course. And so we did a lot of market research. We uncovered that it was a segment of customer who are passionate about technology, but need help with it. And that's many of us, right? What to choose, how to make it work together, how to integrate it. Uh, you know, if it doesn't work, you know, uh, how to get help and so forth. So, uh, but we want, we went beyond simple market segmentation. We, we asked the why question. What's our why? So it's the famous Simon Sinek, you know, video on, uh, you know, how to mobilize an organization, start with why, and which you can call the purpose. And we found that in working with the customers and our team, because purpose is at the intersection of what the world needs, what we care about, what we're good at, and how we can make money. We felt our purpose had to do with enriching lives with technology uh, by addressing key human needs, whether it's uh, communication, productivity, entertainment, health, you know, you name it. And the beauty of thinking about our business with a purpose lens, this is much bigger than the being in the business of selling TVs or computers, right? So uh, we, I've actually told our team, we're not in the business of selling TVs, even though, Walter, if you'd like to buy one, we'll be happy to sell you <laughs> one. But our business our purpose is much bigger than this. Mm -hmm. We want to help you as a human being live a better life. So we, I've said we're in the happiness business. And that's a very human business. The beauty from a strategic standpoint is that this expands vastly the addressable market because just hardware in the US, it's about a $250 billion business, consumer electronics hardware. But if you add everything that's around it, you know, services, solutions, it's a trillion dollar market. And if you take health to illustrate the point, uh, we've decided that health was a, a good place to focus on. And so uh, one of the things we're doing is we're helping aging seniors live longer in their home with the help of technology. So we place sensors you know, under the beds, in the armchair, in the kitchen, in the bathroom. And uh, with technology and artificial intelligence, we can detect if, there's a if something is not going well, if they're not you know, going to the bathroom, if they're not eating, right. if they're not sleeping well. And that's a business, it's a service that's actually not sold in our stores, but it's a huge business opportunity where we're leveraging certain of our capabilities. We've made a few acquisitions. And so we're unleashing growth by having a more, uh, a, a, a more purpose-driven view of the, of the business. Now, what I would say, one of the learnings, Walter, on because many companies today, you know, they, they, they want to have a purpose. They put this on their website. Defining the purpose is an important thing. You need to reflect it in the strategy. But if you, that's the only thing you do, it's probably not going to work. Because in order to, for the organization to mobilize around this, you need to do uh, what I call, you know, unleash human magic. You need to make sure that everybody at the company can connect with that purpose and feel that they can write themselves in that story. And so there is enormous work to be done. You know, if you if you throw a seed on a road, you know, it's not going to grow. If you throw it in the bush, it's not going to grow. If you throw it in a fertile ground, then it's going to grow. And so, uh, as leaders. If you want to be a purposeful human organization, yes, there's some strategy work to be done. Equally important, if not more important, mm -hmm. is to create the environment in which the seeds uh, can can grow in, which is an area where, frankly, I've, uh, we have in that journey had to learn uh, a ton, and but it's been a, a ton of fun too. Yeah. So that brings up a couple of things. One is I, I noticed we have questions coming in. So I just want to let everyone know we have time at the end to uh, to bring those questions to you. We'll just uh, finish our conversation for a few more minutes. Um, you know, I was just thinking as you talked about unleashing uh, human magic that I, I think you can't unleash the, the magic of purpose unless you unleash the human magic. In other words, the two are really tied together, right? You just simply cannot make it come alive unless it's through the people. And uh, we talk a lot of conscious capitalism about business being the most, uh, the, the most the most human thing that exists on the planet. And I think you've really tied those two together nicely. One quick question on that too, is you talk about unleashing human magic though. How did you think about that relative to the traditional financial metrics that we're measuring? You're a public company, you're being measured quarter to quarter. How do you sync those two up for me? 
Yeah, and it's it's uh, you know the story of my life in the last you know twenty years or thirty years in many ways is that uh, so many things I learned when I was at business school or at McKinsey or in my early years as an executive from a leadership and, and business management standpoint is either wrong, incomplete, or outdated. And <laughs> in many ways, which other than this, it's fine, right? <laughs> in, in many ways, yeah. the model that I think we were all taught last century was you take a smart a, a bunch of smart people, put them in a room, maybe you hire a consulting firm, right? And you create a strategy, and hopefully it's a brilliant strategy. Then you create an implementation plan. You communicate this implementation plan, run it out, put incentives in place, and hope that thing, good things happen. Where here's the scoop, that doesn't work. And you know, if you take incentives, for example, there's very interesting research that shows that, uh, except if the job is purely repetitive and mechanical, financial incentives deteriorate performance because it narrows the minds and it focuses purely on the goal of winning as opposed to opening the mind on what is the world that we can create. Mm. And you know, there's a uh, so there's a lot of research on that. So we've had to, I have had to reinvent or learn uh, how to uh, to unleash that human magic. And to your point, a focus on financial results, you know, is poisonous and it doesn't work. It's, it's measuring an outcome. It's like it's, it's a bit like if my doctor, you know, I, I would pay him on the basis of, uh, you know, the the my temperature. I, I'm, I'm concerned that the thermometer would end up in the fridge, right? So that would not be <laughs> uh, So it's almost a symptom. So I think yeah. that the ingredients for me that we found were key to unleashing that human magic are number one, making sure that, and I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, just bear with me, I'm sharing what I've learned. Uh, you know, making sure that everybody at the company can connect what drives them, their individual purpose, Mm -hmm. with the purpose of the company. And what, what a critical moment also was when one evening during an executive offsite, because it, it included the top management team, we shared our life stories and what was our purpose in life. One exercise I sometimes have people do now is write their eulogy or obituary. How do you want to be remembered, right? And then we figured that what was driving us was completely connected to this idea of enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs. And you have to do this at every level. There was a store general manager in Boston. I will always remember this. I was visiting him uh, three or four years ago. He would ask every one of the associates in his store, so about 100 uh, individuals, tell me your dream. At Best Buy or at Saturday, what is your dream? Okay, write it down in the break room. Mm -hmm. And he said, my job, my, one of my responsibilities is to help you achieve your dream. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty significant. So the second thing is, you know, create an environment where genuine, authentic, you know, human connections can be built. Uh, and which, of course, brings the, includes the topic of diversity and inclusion. I remember seeing a young associate. He said his life changed when one day he realized that his manager knew him, knew who he was. So René Descartes, the French philosopher said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. I think this is wrong or certainly incomplete. I would say, ego videor ergo sum, I am seen, therefore I am. Mm. So as an employee, if I realize that people know me, care about me, then I can flourish and so forth. So how do you create this environment? It's a very human environment, right? It's really human, uh, you know, people are at the center of the organization. Then you have the point about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the point of autonomy. Nobody likes to be told. So people like to, you know, have the opportunity to write themselves into their story. So once they understood that if they treated customers as an inspiring friend or as a family member, then they got it. And so I didn't need to tell them more, right? How to treat customers, mm -hmm. but treat them as your friends or as a family member. Uh, create an environment that's growth oriented and where they can master some skills because this is about personal growth mm -hmm. as well. All of this has significant implications from a leadership standpoint 
uh, of course, and I know that uh, there's a great new book out, uh, Conscious Leadership. So you guys are the expert at this. <laughs> so I think with that with that quote in French, we can now say you're a doctor of business, but you're also a doctor of philosophy. But uh, again, I just want to come back again. That all led to the you after your public company, you had to report numbers every quarter. Uh, obviously, you're sharing with us the path to achieve that and by bringing people in and they felt that. And so but I assume that the numbers continue to improve as a result. Right. And you were able to report That's them the out outcome. every quarter. That's the beauty is that if you if you mm-hmm. take care of people and customers, uh, great things happen. I think the, the vision I have of, of business, right, of this purposeful human organization, you have the North Star, the, the purpose as the North Star. You yeah. have people at the center interacting, you know, through human interactions with all of the stakeholders, whether it's the customers, the vendor partners, the community, and the shareholders. And I told one day our shareholders, our purpose is not to make money. Uh, it's an outcome, and, and by the way, I think between the fall of 2012 and now the share price of Best Buy has gone from 11 to, I think it's at 120 or something like this. So we created a lot of value for them. It's important, shareholders are really important because uh, they're at the end of the day, they are the care of our, the retirement of our parents and ourselves you know, at some point. So they're, they're people and, and the idea that shareholders wouldn't care about society and the planet it's a crazy idea they're just other human beings but the key point is to treat profit as an outcome as opposed to the name of the game did you have any pushback from shareholders along the way uh yes uh at the beginning there's a shareholder who said there if you're not at five dollars per share next year you know i'm selling and i said that's okay you know what can i do <laughs> it's, it's your decision uh and i think that's uh, Leaders who use shareholders as an excuse for uh, bad decisions are not good leaders. It doesn't mean it's easy, right? Because of course we have to balance short-term and long-term. You cannot ignore the short-term, that'd be crazy. But you have to be governed by, you know, what's the right uh, thing to do. And, uh, and, you know, in this case, you know, it paid off. And I, I fundamentally believe that this approach of, you know, purpose and, and people is a, is a and it's been a ton of research, as you know, on that. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a yeah. Everybody can go back and look at the stock chart and you can see what Uber is saying. The stock has performed extremely well. So we have about 10 minutes left, Uber. I have three topics I want to cover before we jump to questions. First is you, in your new book, you talk about you've kind of put all this together in a set of leadership principles that you've developed. Do you want to share a little bit about those quickly uh, now? Yeah, it's uh, uh, it builds on what we've been talking about, of course. The first thing is that... Uh, it's, a, it's an invitation to think about why do we work? You know, how do we see work? So at a very personal level, do we see work as a punishment because we sinned in paradise? Or is work something we do so that we can do something else that's more meaningful? You know, it's the question of work-life balance, which almost, I know what work-life balance means, but the phrase itself almost implies that life is outside of work. Well, I'm sorry, most of us, you know, spend a good number of hours working. So I hope that life is part of, uh, of work and that work is part of life. So is it that or is it something else? Is it the idea that we work so that we can do something good in the world? And I fundamentally believe that in the heart of people, every individual, there's a desire to do good things for others. Uh, even Darth Vader, his son said, no, there's still something good in, in this old man, right? And so... My, you know, the philosophy, which is a, a widely shared philosophy across most spiritualities, is that as human beings, we're invited, we have a desire to do something good in the world. Uh, the other discussion around this individual level is that, which took me a long time to try to not be confused or eliminate confusion, is there's a danger in confusing perfection and performance. Of course, in our life, we want, to, we want to do great things. So we have high aspirations because that's the, part of the nature of human beings. But it's very dangerous to have a quest for perfection. Uh, it's certainly a quest for perfection in human activity because here's the scoop. All of us, maybe with the exception of you, Walter, are imperfect. Mm-hmm. And so if as a leader, you work in a team and you expect your team to be perfect, you're going to be you're going to be sad and disappointed and you're going to become inhuman. 
And it's by being human and vulnerable, saying, no, no, my name is Hubert, I need help. Uh, that you can, and so you can aspire for perfect performance of a process, like zero defect. Like I'm glad the fact that when we had used to have planes and flights that they never fail, <laughs> that's a good thing. But in the human interactions, don't expect you know, perfection. So that's the first set of discussion at the personal level. The second set of principles, Walter, is around this vision that a company is a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal and that this goal is not to generate profit. It's an outcome, it's an imperative, but that the goal of a company ultimately is to pursue a noble purpose. And it's the principle that uh, people are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, in that uh, of a company and that it's all about these human mm. interactions and that the key to su business success is uh, to pursue this purpose and mobilize human beings in support of that and it's a principle of interdependence uh, as companies i mean companies are part of the fabric of society companies cannot do well if society is in shambles you know when minneapolis was burning this summer, literally, well, the stores were closed. It's hard to operate in a in a in a world on fire. And yeah. so there's interdependence between the employees, the customers, the communities, the vendors, and the shareholders. And as leaders, we have to recognize this. Then there's principles around how to unleash human magic, we talk, which we talked about. And then I'll finish with leadership principles per se which is the idea that the old model of the leader as the superhero who comes in and saves the day and is driven by power, fame, glory, or money. That's also 20th century. And it's the model of a, a purposeful leader uh, who is not there to be the smartest person in the room and make sure everybody has, knows how smart he is, but is there to create an environment in which others can be successful and where it can be an authentic uh, and, and vulnerable leader. And I'll just finish with you know, one question that Marilyn Carlson Nelson, the uh, then uh, chairman and, and, and CEO of Carlson Companies asked me during my recruiting interview to become the CEO of Carlson. She asked me, Yvette, tell me about your soul. Who asked wow. this question? Yeah, And wow. it's such a good question. I was yes. on a... I was on a flight back with her from Paris to yes. Minneapolis on our private plane. So we had eight hours to talk about this. My goodness uh, sakes. But that's, yeah. that's the principle. So as leaders, we need to lead with all of our body parts, our brain, yes. Yes. our heart, our soul, mm -hmm. our guts, our mm -hmm. hands, our ears, our eyes, all of it. We are integrated in our human beings. That's great. And so all of your, I would just remind everybody that you bear's new book is coming out. And it is entitled The Heart of Business Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. And you can read uh, thoroughly all the principles there when the book comes out. When is it coming out, Hubert? So it's so cool. It's coming out on May the 4th, 2021. Okay. So it's a few months out. So if you're a Star Wars fan, may the force be with us, right? <laughs> but good. you can now pre-order uh, on Amazon. Which and other all, good places. Which we should all do. Let me I'd, let me just segue to one final question in the interest of time. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left. But you mentioned this idea of uh, communities burning this summer and how business is part of that. I want to just ask, I mean, one of the challenges leaders today face is these issues of health equity, racial equity, uh, community participation that have surfaced as a result of all the events of this past summer. How do you, how, as, a, as a CEO today, how would you approach or how do you approach, how do you use the principles to approach uh, and guide a CEO for how they would participate, contribute, run their company with respect to all those sorts of issues that are happening today? Yeah, it's so timely, Walter. Of course, it starts with the realization that as companies and as leaders, we have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis all of these stakeholders. We cannot, you know, it's this declaration of interdependence. So the issue of, you know, structural racism, uh, it's not just, a political issue, it's a business issue, because, you know, the country is becoming brown. So if, if as a company, you know, our team does not represent the customers we serve, we're going to fail. If society is burning, we're going to fail. So it's, an, it's a business, it's a human, uh, philosophical, spiritual, and business imperative to move the needle 
uh, around diversity and inclusion and, and, and creating a sense of belonging. That's an essential element. So as a business leader, we now have to deal, and I'm sure everybody you know, that's listening uh, has this experience. We need to deal with this wide range of topics, which means there's a lot of learning to do. I mean, there was for me, because I grew up in France, so France is also a racist country, but different. So you need to do the, go through the effort of understanding what it is like, what are the obstacles, and not just with your head, but also with your heart, so that then you can create a, a real strategy to affect change. So it's one of these new dimensions we have to take into account. That's right. So now um, we have a number of questions and I, I can see them here on the screen. So one of the first ones is that it's a bit from multiple people is really how did you share the purpose with your board and with your team members? And how did you convince them to go along with it? But how did you communicate it and share it with your board and your team members? So it's not that it was mine and I shared it with anybody. It's something that we uh, that was created by the team, uh, because that's the only way it works. If I if I come and say this is what we're going to do, you know, people are going to say but maybe, but why should I care? So they need to have their fingerprints. So one of the so we had done the strategy work, but the way the purpose really came to life is when we involved. I think Walter, it was probably about sixty of our leaders, middle and upper management. Uh, not members of my team, and who are some of the most highly respected leaders in the company, and to help shape it and make it real for mm. people. And it was did not that include for, members of your board? Did it include members of your board? So later on, we uh, we had taken the board through the strategy, but later on we had them participate in the same training mm. as our frontline employees. I attended a training in a store in New York. Because this, this purpose around enriching lives and being an inspiring friend, it had some you know, guiding behaviors attached to it. The first one being be human, right? How creative is that? Be human. And so we did workshops in the stores. We closed the stores and we did trainings. And we had the associates, and we did the same with the board. We told each other our life stories. And we had to share, tell us about a friend of yours that's inspiring. So for me, it was my older brother. Okay, so now think about your relationship with this inspiring friends. Well, that's the same kind of relationship so that you want to have with the customers. So you had yeah. to make it very real. So this was not a glossy PowerPoint which was communicated through cascading workshops. This was really from the inside, in many ways from the inside out. And the board participated in the same training because we wanted them to fully understand the essence of what we were trying to do. That's good. Alexander, do you want to pick a question for you, Bear? I'm happy to, or if you want to keep facilitating this, you're doing a great job, Walter. Go ahead, pick, <laughs> pick one, Alexander, and I'll pick the next one. Go ahead. So one of the questions we have from Rebecca Hubert is when you left Best Buy, how did you feel comfortable that you knew that it was going to continue with this purpose and beliefs that you had established? Thank you for this question. As you can see, I'm so happy. So uh, Best Buy is led today by a wonderful woman, Corey Barry. In my next life, I want to come back and be just like her. She is amazingly good. And so we went through a process. Uh, you know, we, we had worked on executive development and succession planning. And uh, you know, she had been the head of our strategy group. She had headed services. She had been our CFO, and uh, so we had worked together on the on the strategy. And I know, I knew, and the board knew that she, she had these values. And it's not about exactly continuing what I when we were doing when I was there, because of course it has to evolve. Right? Come on, who would have predicted the crisis, the COVID crisis, right? But it was the what gives me confidence is that the the soul of the company, you know, uh, is 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 very vibrant, and uh, the leadership values and principles uh, are there. And it makes me so happy to see that uh, uh, not only did the place did not fall apart when I left, but it actually continued to blossom. And I admire how they are leading. And that's one of our responsibilities as a leader, right? To make sure that when we leave, things get better. Yeah, 
So there's a question from Edward, kind of a challenging one. He says, uh, you say the profit is the outcome. He said, isn't it more the fuel? What's your response? As well, it's the fuel as well, right? Because then you get to, so it's all of these interdependencies, right? It's, it's the, uh, it's an outcome. You generate some cash, you reinvest the cash. So we were very clear with our board and our shareholders that the first priority was to reinvest the cash in the, in the business and profitable opportunities organically and, ex and, and inorganically, some acquisitions that made sense. You distribute the surplus to the, to the shareholders because again, the shareholders are really important. They take care of our retirement. So we care <laughs> about them. But uh, the, the point is very well taken. It's, uh, it's, it's, the key is to create this virtuous cycle, right? Where good things happen and then it becomes uh, it's your flywheel image. Uh, Walter. Yeah. So Jorge from Peru uh, asked the question, how do you think you're, you, you're actually from European extraction. Um, how, does the different, how does the approach to conscious capitalism in your view differ outside of the US from the US? So it's interesting this morning, I was on a workshop with 40 young leaders, uh, half US, half uh, French, uh, selected by the French American Foundation. You know, there's differences. For example, the word capitalism in France is not seen as a good word. Uh, you know, it, in, in the US, it's, in, it's okay to, to, to have capitalism as, as a system in France. It's, uh, if you're a capitalist, you're a suspect. So there's some nuances. But what's common is always the same. It's the human desire to, to do some good things in the world. So pursue a noble purpose. And it's the human desire to have human beings have a, a better life. Uh, we could enter into a, a discussion around, you know, what are the differences between the US and Europe and France in, in particular. But what I'm seeing is that it's more at the level of each individual, any one of us, wherever we come from, we get to decide, we're the captains of our soul. And uh, studying various, various philosophies and spiritualities around the world, I think the value, the underlying values we're talking about are incredibly universal. When you sp study Hindu spirituality, the Gita, it's the same values as the Geo-Christian uh, uh, philosophies and spirituality in many ways. And Islam also has a lot in, in, in common. So the, because I'm saying this because when I was, Best Buy was not really a global organization, but in my previous lives, I, I was the CEO of, in Castle Bag, when you travel, we were in 150 countries, right? So, you know, uh, to think about, can some of these principles apply across cultures? And I was mm -hmm. struck, you know, when we were serving global clients like GE or G JP Morgan or Accenture and so forth, you know, we had teams made of, uh, let's say Russians and Poles working together or uh, Germans and French working together, meaning countries that uh, had fought over the centuries working together to serve clients and as human beings. So I'm a bit of a, an optimist, but I think that uh, there's a lot of commonality across cultures here. Yeah. So the final question, then I'll throw it back to Alexander for close, uh, which is if somebody asks, uh, Hubert, what is your personal higher purpose? Oh, so my purpose, um, it took me time to articulate it, but it's, it's, it's what it is. It's to try and create a positive difference on people around me in my immediate proximity and use the platform I have to try to make a positive difference in the world. And today, uh, with very concretely, what this means is I want to add my voice and my energy to what I think we all believe probably is the necessary Refoundation of business and capitalism around purpose and humanity. And I'm doing this for the book. I'm doing this. This is the reason why I'm teaching at Harvard Business School. I'm doing this also by coaching and mentoring, like you're doing, Walter, executives and CEOs. And I'm also on a couple of boards for, for that reason. So that's my that's my purpose. That's wonderful. And uh, well, I think we've come to time, Hubert, but it's been a it's been a quick rapid 45 minutes i think everybody would agree and uh in in thanking you for joining this morning can't wait to get your book we should all go to amazon and reserve a copy of that so we send a clear message that it really matters and uh and congratulations on your new position at harvard uh, the students are so lucky to have you so uh thanks for you back over to you alexander thank you
If I wish we had another 45 minutes with the two of you. So just want to say thank you so much for giving us your valuable time and sharing these incredible insights with the Conscious Capitalism community.